Welcome back to the Double Egg. I'm one half of the show. Hey, Jod Picks, the other half of the show, the parlay. Joining me in to recap some UFC 293. Let's get into it. Sean Strickland is the middleweight champion of the world. I know there were some people that claimed to have predicted it, and uh, some people did, but I don't think anyone had that much confidence in it that it would actually happen, especially in that fashion, because he went out there and clearly beat Izzy. Like It wasn't some fluke-type win. He clearly went out there and beat him 49-46. So crazy stuff. This is the world we're living in, 2023 in the, the UFC. You never know what's going to happen. That was one of two underdogs that came through on the night and the biggest one on the card. So props to Sean Strickland. What a world we live in. What do you think of it? All things considered, maybe the greatest or at least top two or three greatest upsets we've ever seen in the UFC. Like if you consider what Sean Strickland comes from, the life you know he lived growing up to get to this point and then fight, uh, the maybe arguably the best striker in the UFC currently and one of the best ever. And to beat him 49-46 on all three judges' scorecards on the feet the whole entire fight, too, is it, super impressive. Like He made Israel Adesanya miss more shots than Izzy has ever missed. At one point, the strikes was like 60-20 to 20 in favor of Strickland. Nobody does that to Izzy. Not even Alex Pereira, uh, you know, some of these other decent strikers. But Sean Strickland with the Philly shell marches forward, was cracking him at times, too. Uh, super impressive, dude. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what... How do you beat Sean Strickland if if you can't land those shots like that? Because he's tough and strong enough and, and he's good enough in the wrestling to keep it on the feet. Like if we get that Sean Strickland every time he comes out, he's gonna be so hard to beat for anybody. As yeah, it, it was wild. So I was watching it just in disbelief, especially when he cracked him in the first. But uh we had 12 fights on the card. Uh, we're gonna go through them and, and give them a little recap. Mainly just the uh, main card fights. We'll touch on the prelims, but for the double like premium picks. I went down minus 1.95 units on the night. A couple bad beats in there with the Jenkins injury. Um, the Olberg decision gets called back to the sub. It was a, a tough night for me, uh, but, I mean, just a, a slight loss there. We'll take it. You always got to take uh, your losses on the chin. Move on to next week. How to go for you. Yeah, I was down just under three units, and I, mean, I thought I made some good reads, and then I made some terrible reads, and we'll talk about some of them. Started the night night off really hot with Juset. Um, we hit a parlay in there called the decision prop on a couple of fights. Um, just some of those some of the spots I chose, I just looked back and I was disappointed into it in, in it. But we'll get into it here. Um, overall, though, just a kind of a roller coaster of a night for betting. It was, it was, and especially you cap it off with uh, Izzy losing in the the main event. I know a lot of people probably had him as the last leg of the parlay, and then there there it goes. So yeah, we'll start with the main event. Um, I mean, just to go over it, I was watching him and he cracked him in the first and then Izzy comes back, wins round two, but it doesn't, it's, there's no change of game plan from Izzy. It's it, like Sean Strickland's just marching him down the entire fight. Izzy's still trying to fight off the back foot and uh counter strike. It's, it just wasn't working and he had no answer for, uh, for Sean Strickland because Strickland was not going to give him any space to work. And if you look at like the significant strike differential, 85 strikes to the head for Sean Strickland, only 22 in five rounds for Izzy. So he touched Sean Strickland in the, in the head only 22 times. The majority of his strikes were to the body and the legs because he just couldn't hit Sean Strickland off of the Philly shell. He just, he just couldn't do it. And uh, maybe that just messed with his confidence. I'm sure getting rocked in the first round Mess with his confidence uh, because I'm probably thought he was going to run through Sean Strickland. Then he gets cracked, and then he's having trouble finding the head, uh, finding the chin, and he's like, "I don't know what to do." Never really changed anything though. That that was the big thing for me. I was like, "You're the champion, man. You got to show some like champion heart. Like you're losing clearly. There's no change of game plan, no risks being taken. It looked very weird as far as." You know, what we've seen from Izzy is like usually wears his heart on his sleeve. He's going to go out there and and fight to the best of his abilities. I didn't really see that from him last night. What do you what do you think? 
Yeah, I didn't see it either. And honestly, this might be the first time that we saw Israel Adesanya like mentally flustered heading into a fight. Like Sean Strickland did a pretty damn good job for the last few months of just being on Izzy with the mental with the mental game and just, you know, talking all this trash, bringing up personal stuff. Um, you know, the whole dog stuff, Sean Strickland wouldn't let go. I mean, he was given everything he had into building this fight and just getting in Izzy's head. And normally that doesn't work, but I mean, maybe that was part of it because Izzy didn't fight like the same fighter. Like he let Sean Strickland march forward the whole entire fight and he fought with his back against the fence. I don't know if he expected to land a big knockout shot at some point and was just waiting for it and it never came. But uh, I mean, Sean Strickland was just super impressive with the defense. And I listened to a lot of Sean Strickland's uh, podcasts that he does and interviews and he was on one with the Nelk boys. And I thought this is exactly how he fought, what he talked about, you know, he was basically calling the Nelk boys soft and like little kids and stuff like that. And that when they walk into a room, they need to demand respect from everybody there. And everybody knows that you're going to respect him just by walking through the door. That's exactly what Sean Strickland did the whole fight. He stood in front of Izzy and he basically, you know, said, you're going to respect me standing here until you crack me or do something, but I'm going to be in your face all night. And I mean, that's exactly how he fought and it paid off because he landed the more volume. He landed the bigger shots. I mean, I don't think there was a moment in the fight that Izzy was fighting going forward unless it was just kind of, you know, a quick kick upstairs and, and like a jab or something. Other than that, it was Sean straightforward all night long. Um, and, and if you look at some of the kicks that Izzy threw upstairs to the head, like they missed by like two or three feet because Sean would just catch him like with his arms extended out, like nothing came close to landing like that. Yeah. Uh, so I was super impressed with Sean, man. That was, that was crazy. And just to go to Australia and do it, I mean, I think he only showed up like five or six days before the fight. You know, a huge time difference. Like, he doesn't give a shit. Like, this dude is just, I don't know. This dude's something else, man. It, it's a scary thought because he can go into the octagon and doesn't really care what happens to him. He talked about in his post fight, like, he doesn't really care about fighting. He fights in the UFC so he can just train full time. Like, he loves training. So, yeah, somebody like that who's unbreakable. And, you know, you basically got to hit him with your best shot and hope that you knock him out because if not, he's going to be in your face all night long. It, it, it's been fun to watch. And, uh, it's gonna be tough to beat, man. He really is. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy how he did it because he was like calling Izzy spineless and and a coward. It kind of showed it, like <laughs> yeah. kind of spineless and like a coward off the back foot the entire fight. Never gave Sean anything to respect, really. But a lot of that does have to do with Strickland's striking defense. Like mm -hmm. for how much that he spars, I guess you would kind of expect like his striking defense to be that good the reactions to be able to like catch those feints from izzy because izzy faints a lot and he's not like overreacting too much and izzy would try to go to the body and then to the head and mix it up but sean was all over it with like everything it was it was a very good performance for sean strickland and i don't i mean i would definitely say there's a something off with izzy but a lot of that can be attributed to strickland uh the way he fought i mean you can't really take anything away from uh strickland in that aspect yeah i think too like i just think this is the one fight that izzy couldn't figure out how to hit how to land shots against an opponent like he could not yeah. figure out how to get his shots through because he was trying but sean was keen to everything kicks jabs everything he got out of the way or he blocked it was rolling with everything like i don't know i don't even know if sean trained for that style i think he just goes in there and, and fights how he normally fights and I you know, kind of just adjusts as fights goes on, but yeah, super impressive. Yeah, how about that? That last ten seconds, he's like oh, screaming man. at him. Is he still still going backwards? It's like, yeah, dude, I just fucking destroyed you, man. <laughs> like, Izzy knew he needed a finish, and he just yeah. couldn't even get. Like, he couldn't even get to the point where he could go for it. And yeah, it I was, think it was nuts. Yeah, yeah. Sean screaming like that is gonna go down as like you know you're gonna see that picture forever of him yelling at Izzy in the last ten seconds. So and, pretty cool. The fact that he knew he was he was about to win ten oh, seconds, yeah. left, and he's hands down walking towards him screaming, and he's just not doing anything. I was like, "Yeah, you deserve everything uh, that you get with this championship because you just yep. destroyed arguably the best middleweight in history." Now most people will probably say not, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the argument was there for sure. Volkov Tuivasa, this one was tough to watch. Uh, <laughs> Damn, Tuivas, dude. I don't even know if. Um, I mean, on paper, the matchup just doesn't look that great. Mm -hmm. Volkov has experience. He's only been knocked out what twice in his career, so there's that. But I really felt like Tuivasa could go in there and 
force the action as far as getting on the inside, maybe even throwing him up against the cage. And he tried to whip those light kicks in, but just couldn't, man. It, it got to the point where I think we're starting to understand Tuivasa is kind of like a human punching bag. Like he doesn't take anything as far as defensive head movement. He doesn't really check anything as far as light kicks go. I mean, he's going to take damage quickly. And to that point, it's like once you start racking up the damage, there's that point where you're like, I don't know if I want to be in here anymore. Uh, you kind of saw it in the Ciro Gaon fight. Like he racked up so many significant strikes that by the third round, he just, he kind of just had enough. Like he would still be in there throwing, but there was times where he's like, take it. He'd be like, oh, I can't. I don't want to stay in here anymore. Uh, and then the Pavlovich fight, it was like over in a blink. This one reminded me a lot of the Gaon fight where it's like, just a matter of time where Ty's eventually going to have to break because he's taking too much damage. Yeah. It was a bad, bad performance for Ty. It sucks to watch because he's so fun to watch when he's uh, not fighting like the best of the best. But yeah, it, it's clear what Tui Vasa is now. What'd you think? Yeah. I mean, it, it just, he's not eating shots that good anymore. Um, you know, Volkov hit him with a couple shots where he was on wobbly legs early, but, you know, Ty, there was a glimmer of hope going into the second round. You know, he survived the first, and then he started to get the leg kicks going, like, really well and was doing damage, you could tell. And uh, Volkov was kind of breathing with his mouth open and getting a little tired. And then Ty throws a shot, and he slips and lands on his back. And, you know, big guy like that's not fast enough to get up in time for, you know, to avoid Volkov just coming down and, and, and getting in dominant position. And once a six, seven dude like Volkov has you in mount, like you're not really getting out, regardless of how strong you are. Like that's a lot of, um, that's a, you know, that's a long ass dude to, to get um, back to, to your feet under. So yeah, it sucks. Um, I was waiting for the big shot to come from Ty. He landed some decent shots, but overall, you know, the, the quick, he's got quick hands for a big guy. But when you're fighting a guy that's six, seven, like it's just hard to close the distance in time and throw the shot in a manner that, um, you know, Volkov doesn't see coming, but Volkov was pretty keen to everything he was throwing and and did a good job of getting out of the way, landing some good teep kicks, landing some good uppercuts that had Ty rocked. And overall, just, I don't know, I don't know what Ty, to, what Ty Tuivasa does from here. I don't think he's got any title hopes left, probably. Um, you know, he's got some fun fights out there, guys like Derek Lewis who are a little bit older and are big heavy hitters. But, uh, you know, he can't eat those big shots anymore. He just can't. We've seen it in his last, I don't know how many fights. But, yeah, it sucks to see, too, because he's so fun when he's winning. Yeah, I mean, he gets hit a lot. Like, he does. three significant strikes in less than two rounds. Gone put on 110 in less than three rounds. Pavlovich put 23 on him in less than a minute. So, yeah. like, dude, he's got to he's gotta learn some movement or, or do something. because. <laughs> yeah. You get hit that many times at heavyweight, you're not going to be around yeah. too much longer, especially just in a fight. Like you can't last in a fight like that. So, right. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, Manel Cop and Felipe Dos Santos was uh, quite the scrap. I can't believe those guys made it to the end because they were throwing abs absolute hammers. Dos Santos, what is he, 22, 23 years old? First mm -hmm. fight in the UFC against a ranked opponent. Definitely held his own. Uh, and just push an absolute pace. I was impressed by uh, Dos Santos. Cop, I was impressed with the way he handled like getting cracked a good, a good amount of times, and he was confident in, in his abilities. But I don't know if he could fight that reckless and like make it to the top. You know, so what do you think? Yeah, um, I'm just glad that they that Felipe Dos Santos contender series fight didn't happen because he probably would have destroyed his opponent. Like this dude, he he showed he belongs, and he probably belongs in you know the top fifteen in the UFC. Like, I, I think everybody expected Cop to win, and I thought that Felipe Dos Santos would be pretty damn tough and have a few moments. But I mean, he pretty much went tit for tat with him. He didn't really land the you know damaging shots that Cop did. But as far as the numbers and significant strikes, they were pretty damn even. And um, you know, for your debut, seven only six professional fights, I believe, or seven heading into last night. And you draw Manel Cop, who's not only a top 10 fighter in the flyweight division, but he's one of the fastest uh, strikers. He's strong. He can wrestle a little bit. He'll submit you. 
And uh, I mean, he absolutely cracks. And Dos Santos was able to just eat that. I mean, he did get knocked down and he was wobbled a few times. But once he was back to his feet, like it didn't phase him one bit. The dude just kept marching forward. I mean, he's he looked like a mini Charles Oliveira. Even, you know, throw in the getting dropped. He's got that tie style and uh, super fun to watch. I just hope he doesn't take too much damage over the course of these next few years because he does get hit a lot. And yeah. uh, even though his chin's really good, like that's not always the best thing. You don't want to be known for having a good chin. So, um, but I think he is super talented. I, I want to see him on the ground more too. I, I feel like his ground game is probably super good. Never really got a chance to show it, but uh, you know, I think this guy's well rounded and he's going to be a fun prospect to watch. Yeah, I'm excited to watch him. Um, I mean, he threw 300 significant strikes. <sighs> He only landed 32% of them, but he was just throwing everything at Manel mm -hmm. Cop. And Manel Cop, I mean, it's tough to avoid that many shots from a, a fast guy like Dos Santos. So that's props to him for that. Cop landed 61%, uh, 112 significant strikes at 61%. Like he was having some really nice moments with the hands as well. So a good scrap. That was a fight of the night, I believe. So yep. very deserving. Justin Taffa, Austin Lane. Uh, I mean, as soon as Austin Lane stopped throwing the kicks and he started throwing hands, I'm like, it's only a matter of time before Tafa absolutely cracks him because he was leaving his head out there. <laughs> and uh, Tafa was just waiting for his moment to land that big left. It only took him a minute 22. Uh, Austin Lane getting knocked out. What you think of that one? Yeah, Lane has like the athleticism and all of that, but I, don't, I just don't think he quite understands the MMA striking yet. I mean, he like you said, he just leaves his chin out there and like he'll throw a big shot and then he'll just almost like lag in front of the guy and just wait to get hit. And, you know, Toffa's powerful, landed the big left that put him down. But yeah, I'm not exactly like high on Toffa either, though. I don't know. A lot of people are, you know, super excited for Justin Toffa and thinks that he's going to be, you know, the next Mark Hunt. But I mean, He's lost to Jared Vendera. He's not going to, I don't think he's going to go make title runs, but I, I don't think Austin Lane is really UFC caliber either. So, yeah, super frustrating fight to watch because I, I didn't bet on Lane, but um, I picked him to win because I thought the athleticism and the length, he would fight a little bit smarter and just fight from the outside and just make it hard for Toffa to land. But that was not the case at all. He came forward and knocked him straight out. So, yeah, it is what yeah. it is there. Yeah, I thought he could use his kicks more. Uh, yeah. And eventually, he wanted to mix in the hands, which is like, you're going to have to, but mm -hmm. just absolutely no awareness for like where Tafa's power was. Like, yeah. it's obviously in the left hand. Don't overextend with your right hand because he's going to come across and hit you with the left. So, yeah, there's there's that. And like middling heavyweights, you could have seen that yeah. one. <laughs> Pedro Turcali. We were both on Pedro. That was the uh, free play of the week, which hits for the fifth time in a row, I believe. Oh, yeah. Uh, this was the, the buy low spot of the week for me. I, I really thought Tyson Pedro fight against Sydney. Uh, I just think he's the more skilled guy than Turk Alley. He's good on the feet, good on the ground. I think he outmatched him on the feet. It like nine times out of 10. And in this one, I, I looked at that Petrino fight with, uh, Turk Alley and Petrino was cracking him with so many shots. And I would accredit like Petrino cracking him that many times to Pedro knocking him out this time because <laughs> yeah. there's only so many of those big shots you could take at 205 before that chin gives out. Pedro hit him with a good couple. He hit him with like four or five good punches. Finally dropped him and he's and he's gone. So good win for Pedro. Um, and I'm glad he got a win. What'd you think? Yeah, you and I talked about on the on the preview show. You know, like Pedro's last fight. Something was off. I know he was sick, maybe injured, and the gas tank wasn't there. You know, you could just tell he wasn't up for fighting at all. And we said if he'd come in healthy here, he was going to be, you know, he's probably going to get this win. Like, he's going to take care of take care of Anton Tricali. And, um, you know, the move to city kickboxing, the striking looked sharper. He looked faster. I mean, he was definitely healthy last night. He looked really strong and fit in there. And, uh, you know, the first shot he, he really landed that was flush, you could tell um, Tricali was just – you know, a little shocked, I think, by the power and couldn't get anything going at all. And I thought if he was healthy, if Pedro was healthy too, you know, he'd be able to keep this fight on the feet and the big knockout shot was going to come sooner or later. And it did. And uh, like, like you said, man, perfect by low spot. I think Tyson Pedro isn't the best fighter in the world, but he's going to beat guys like Turkali, who 
yeah. you know, are going to want to wrestle and aren't the best on the feet. Like if he can keep fights standing, he'll find big knockouts. So I was glad to see him get the win for sure. Yep. Uh, Carlos Olber getting the win over Dawoon Jung. This was the bad beat I referred to earlier. Uh, <laughs> I was on Olberg by decision and the fight ends and I thought I was going to cash it. And then, uh, well, it was a sweat. I'll say that it was the, an absolute sweat of the last 30 seconds of the fight. So I thought he could, he had that arm trapped. I thought he was going to TKO him. And then he had this, the arm under the neck. And I was like, Herb Dean, don't you step in. Don't you step in. And then uh, goes to the decision or the, or the fight ends. And I think we cash. And then they go review it and subbed him with 11 seconds left. So that's the first win by a submission for Carlos Olberg. Interesting way to do it. What do you think of the fight overall? Um, Olberg, I thought, landed some really good kicks, and his jab was working really well. But I was frustrated watching because he wouldn't throw the right hand, like, at all. I don't know. He wasn't throwing it hardly at all. I had Olberg uh, by round two or in, in three KO, so I was waiting for it to come. Like, he was hurting Daun Jung every time he touched him, and then he'd just kind of get away from it. But, uh, yeah, I think he was fighting a little more, cons like, trying to conserve some more energy last night. I think he was expecting more wrestling to come. And I think he thought probably he was going to need that energy as the fight went on. And the wrestling just never came from Daun Jung. And, uh, you know, I was, I've was i never really seen them go back in and look for a tap like that on replay. Like, maybe it's happened. I just can't recall off the top of my head. But when the fight ended, like, I don't know. I didn't see a tap live. Uh, camera was probably on the wrong side anyways. But I was, like, shocked to see that, yeah, they're going to go look and see if he tapped. And I know... You know, you want to give the, the the rightful winner the win. And, you know, if he did tap, then it's automatically Carlos Olberg. You don't have to worry about any kind of, you know, screw job by the judges or anything. But, man, I was kind of surprised they went back and looked at it. I don't know. I don't know. Somebody cage side had to have seen it because Herb Deem sure as hell was not in position to see it. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the theme of last night. Herb Deem missed so much, I feel like. Not the not the dog on him, but he missed a couple of big cage grabs from Daun Jung when when Olberg tried to get the takedowns, um, you know, he was on the he was on the side that Daun Jung had his arm trapped. Like that was the sign Herb D that was the side that Dean was looking at for the tap. It's like, dude, he doesn't even have an arm free there. Like, what are you looking in there for? Wasn't on the right side. And then I guess they go to the replay booth and decide he tapped. So that does suck because I know you had decision. And once my my bet wasn't gonna hit, I was rooting for yours. And just to see him go in there and overturn that was just so shitty. Yeah, I don't I mean, I understand it, and I do think he, he probably tried to tap, but at the yeah. same time, he didn't like – he tapped and then made it to decision. So it's like yeah. – it's not like the guy stopped fighting. Or went uh, out. <laughs> yeah, or went out. It's like, it's like if someone hits a clean knockdown and the guy's unconscious, and then the guy hits him again, and then he's back conscious. It's like, yeah. all right, well, he was knocked out, and then he's back in it. So it's like – I don't know. It's, it's just kind of dumb. Uh, obviously, yeah. I'm gonna be pissed about it because I had the decision, but it wasn't like some huge swing. But sucks because he was gonna win either way. Like, yeah, he was gonna win either way. As far as Olberg's performance, I think he fought a little conservative after the first round, which is kind of why I bet that by decision because he's he's good in the first round, explosive in the first round, had the knockdown, and then after that, I think he just it's like okay, I don't want to gas out. Because I got ten more minutes of this, and maybe he's feeling a little heavy. But he looked fresh. He looked fresh. He just, mm -hmm. just didn't really feel like he wanted to uh, overextend on anything because he knew, all right, I can beat this guy with the basics. I'll throw the jab out there and just yeah. triple it up and stuff like that. But yeah. Uh, and then the call up for Dominic Reyes. That was <laughs> that's wild. the worst call out I've ever seen wild. in my life. Oh man, yeah, that was a. Bitch call out, I ain't gonna lie. Better than dropping the F uh the F A bomb. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh Chepe and uh Jack Jenkins is the injury for Jack. I don't really have much on this this one other than Jack looked good in the first round. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a regular throw. Obviously, from what I was told, I've never been in a judo throw, but from what they were saying on the broadcast, is like you don't want to post with an arm if you're getting thrown because that's how it snaps. He yeah. does it. That's why it snapped. And uh, tough one for Jack Jenkins fighting in your home country. You're trying to get your what third UFC win. You're a favorite. Uh, you're winning the fight, and then you get injured. It's a tough one. What you think? Yeah, he was winning the fight, and you know, up against the cage for a good amount of time. Like, 
he was doing a decent job of defending the takedowns. He just couldn't really separate in that second round yeah. anytime that, you know, he kind of got a hold of the wrist and stuff. But um, yeah, first round, I thought he did some really good work, did some good work with the kicks and kind of turned Chepe from an exciting fighter to a, a boring fighter pretty quick. I think Chepe was feeling those leg kicks, like regardless if he was showing it or not. He was eating a lot of them and uh, they were pretty powerful too. So uh, that's a fight you just wish you could have seen all three rounds just because of the, you know, the past fights with, like these two have had. Both guys are exciting. Both guys can end the fight. So it sucks it ended that way, especially if, if you're on Jack Jenkins. It really sucks because you never want to better a fight to end by injury. And uh, you just hope it isn't too serious either because that, that looked pretty nasty when it, when it happened. So hopefully it's an easy fix and he bounces back. Yeah, Jenkins got clean stand-up. It's just the, the cage control and getting back up from a takedown. That's where he's he's going to have to improve his game. Yeah, he's so good. Like Everybody's going to be looking for the kicks, and then he comes straight down the pipe with the right hand. Like That makes him really yeah. dangerous on the feet. Switches stances really fluidly, too, mm -hmm. and uh, mixes up the kicks to the body. Really nice. Uh, Malarkey, Mac Desi. I don't got much on this one other than uh, Jamie. Never bet on Jamie Malarkey. I'm just never going <laughs> to. Yeah. So I, I, I saw that. I don't, they didn't even score it as a knockdown, but he clearly knocked down Jamie Malarkey. Oh, Mac yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't under, I didn't really understand, like, Mac Desi's game plan. Like, I he was looking for the stand-up, but he knocked him down, and he didn't even do anything. I was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, this is your chance. Uh, but, yeah. You got anything on that one? I'm a little surprised it wasn't a split decision. Yeah, um, I would agree. And I'm... I mean, honestly, you could have scored the fight pretty easily for Mac Desi. Round two is when he got the knockdown, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I thought Mac Desi round two and then round three, I'd probably say Mac Desi too. I mean, you're judging off damage. Like, Malarkey's face was busted up pretty bad. I mean, he, he outstruck him significant strikes 38 to 29 in the third, too. Like, yeah. I don't know. I, I, was, I was fully expecting to hear a split decision for Mac Desi, if I'm being honest. Yeah, and when they said when they said all three judges score this 29-28, I was like, "Oh, wait a second. You know, or maybe it wasn't all three, all three, but however yeah. they scored it, I was like, "Well, if all three are if it's unanimous, like it's got to be kind of McDessie." But here in Malarkey, um, maybe had something to do with being on in Australia, but I don't know. Yeah, for sure. He was uh, pressured a little bit more too. I would say that, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Hack Paras Quinones. I will be honest, I didn't even watch this one because um, I didn't really have too much in it. I mean, I, I had it on the TV. I wasn't really watching that much. Mm -hmm. But uh, from what I was watching, it was an absolute barn burner. What do you think? Yeah, it was a pretty fun fight to watch. Like, Canones, I didn't expect the leg kicks that he had in his arsenal. Like, he was really, really good and effective with those. And uh, there was a few points. I had Nazareth by decision. And there was a few times I was like, man, he's going to get finished here because he's going to kick the legs out from Hackbrass, and Hackbrass is just going to be a one-leg fighter, and it's just a matter of time. Like, Canonez was extremely tough, too. He was eating some really big shots. Nazareth definitely landed more shots and the better, uh, more damaging blows. But the leg kicks, man, you could tell Hackbrass was really struggling towards the end of the second and into the third with those. Um, so props to Canonez. I think he showed that, um, you know, he could probably win some fights in the UFC. Um, I don't necessarily think he's going to be a, a, some dominant prospect or anything, but Hackpress is a slick striker. And if you can, you know, hang in there with him on the feet and land 152 strikes on him, like I think you probably belong somewhere, you know, entry level UFC, you know, somewhere in that range. But uh, yeah, overall, just a pretty decent striking fest. Main thing I noticed is Quinones looked kind of big. He did like, look big compared to Hackpress, like on Tapology. Hackpress is, is an inch taller and two inches in reach, but I thought Quinones looked like the bigger guy. Mm -hmm. kind of weird. Um, Charles Racky, Blood Diamond. This was an absolute god awful fight. Uh, I mean, the real thing that stole the show was Racky's post fight speech, you could call it. Um, I don't know. I don't really have anything to say about the fight, but as far as the uh, the f bombs, we didn't even talk about cop cop, but. <laughs> yeah. What a night. I mean, my God, what, is, what was going on with Australia? <laughs> the, uh, the F bombs. Uh, but I, I saw that one tweet. It was like the over one and a half F bombs or uh, yeah. hit. And I was like, how, how do you even come up with that? To be like, after, after uh, Radke did it, he's like, the over one and a half is looking good. And then cop. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> what is going on here? This guy's crazy. 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's more entertainment, I guess, but probably not get the best for your career. Yeah. Uh, Gabriel Miranda, Shane Young. Young getting subbed in under a minute, man. Get that guy out of the UFC. Yeah, get him out. Good Lord. I don't even understand how he got a fourth fight uh, after – well, he, has, he had three straight losses coming into this one. I didn't understand why they kept him around. Maybe just to have a another CKB guy on this card. But, yeah, that's probably going to be the end for him. Rough one for there. Yeah. You got anything on that one? Uh, no, I, I thought Shane, if he wanted to win, he could have won the fight. And he had one job, and it was to keep it on the feet or at least survive that first round. Because after the first round, I think Shane Young could have um, done some decent work on the feet. And I think Miranda probably would have tired out because Miranda has like that explosive first round where he's just shooting takedowns and kind of burning himself out. And uh, I, I thought Shane Young had a chance if it got past that, but it didn't even get past a minute. So, yeah, it was a rough one. Uh, Jusette Crosby, round one sub for Jusette. Pretty good win, I guess. I mean, he didn't look great, but he no. pulled off the win and mixed it up, got the sub. Uh, not too much to say on that one. Yeah. No. No, I mean, we both said, you know, Kiefer Crosby went four and three in Bellator. He's not that good of a fighter, and Jusette has some skills. So um, I think it was a good read on you and I's part, though, to take him on the money line. Here's the one thing I'll say about this one is because he's like Conor McGregor's buddy, like mm -hmm. Kiefer Crosby is. Every time, like, Conor has, like, he, when he's involved with a fighter and they lose, all he does is like be a yes man to him. He's like, yeah. he just basically tries to like lift him up as much as he can. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, dude, he was like arguably winning slash in the fight and then just completely blew it, like giving up his neck on a sub. I'm like, that's yeah. just, it doesn't help them if you're like, good job, Keeper Crosby. Like, way to go in there and give it your all. Be like, bro, you're winning the fight and then you just messed up. Like, yeah. Yeah, that needs to be addressed. That's why you weren't in the UFC for so long. It's kind of dumb, but yep, that's just my beef with uh, Conor McGregor's way he goes about stuff. But yeah, that's the recap. UFC 293 Strickland era is upon us, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see how things shake out in the middleweight division. Um, but if you're going to ask Strickland, he doesn't really care. He's just going to let the UFC do whatever they want to do. And Odds are they're going to do what makes the most money. So will we see a rematch? Possibly. One last thing as far as do you think he should get the rematch? Uh, well, here's the thing. Like normally I'd say yes because he was such a dominant champion for a long time. And, you know, maybe the UFC owes him that for out of respect. But, you know, he lost the belt and then got an immediate rematch against Alex. And now he just lost again. And, like, do you give him an immediate rematch or do you do him and, and Dreykus Duplessis or you could do Jared Cannonier for the rematch with Sean Strickland now. And then the winner of DDP and Izzy could fight the winner of Sean Strickland and uh, Jared Cannonier would be my take on it. So I don't know. I think you could do the rematch, I guess. But, um, you know, Sean Strickland beat his ass. It wasn't like it was a split decision, you know, 47, 46. I mean, it wasn't like a, it wasn't a close that close or 48, 47, but it wasn't that close of a fight. I mean, Sean just beat his ass for four, four of the five rounds. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be upset with the rematch because I understand where the UFC would probably be coming from. But at the same time, like I feel like there's you know two pretty good fights out there you could do to get back to each other or you know kind of keep some new blood coming in and out of that championship slot. So, yeah, I don't really want to see a rematch because you pair the fact that he clearly beat him with the fact that he already got an immediate rematch with Pereira. It's like it just doesn't. It's just kind of dumb. It probably I mean, like. The most money, though. That's the thing. It's yeah. probably the most money. Izzy's the biggest star. Strickland versus Cannoneer. Doesn't sell. Oh, no. Not going to sell much. Strickland versus no. DDP is like a little bit better. A Strickland versus like a Hamza. Maybe even would be. That'd be fun. Be good. That'd be fun. Yeah, it would be good Uh, because he's Hamza's a big star. They really just need like, like Strickland's grown into his own stardom, but they got to pair him up with somebody to like build it a little bit and like with cannoneer you just can't really do that even though it's yeah. a match just it's just tough to do um i think you do strickland ddp because ddp i think deserves it but it sounds mm -hmm. like dana white's kind of pissed at ddp so we'll see yeah. what they do but yeah strickland air is upon us and uh what do we got next week noche 
UFC Noche or whatever. Uh, Grasso versus Shevchenko, Vegas card. Got 11 or 12 fights on that one. We'll bring you the uh, breakdown for that in the next video. Also breaking down the Dayway Contender Series fights uh, right after this. So stay tuned for that. For the channel, hit the subscription button. Uh, you can follow us at the Double Egg on Instagram, at HeyJetPicks on the medias for me. Where can they find you? All social media is at the Parlay MMA. All right. So next video, the Double Egg. Signing out.